This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. going to just get started with questions. I'll warm it up by sure. asking you one or two. Sure. Um, I think I'll ask you one content question mm -hmm. and one more meta question. I like you it. choose. What would you like first? Uh, let's do content first. Okay, content. I'm interested in the military sort of motif and metaphors and background mm -hmm. um, that informed uh, Marwin Call. So sure. could, I mean, there was one mention of Marx being uh, in the Navy, but Correct. it really didn't come to the fore. Mm -hmm. So what was the role of... He was in the Navy very early in his life. Um, David, the person who saw him along the side of the road and asked him what he was doing, and which started his sort of journey into the real world, so to speak, um, always said it interestingly, I think, was that Mark, for being a heterosexual cross-dresser, he, he always had such a male side to him and, and a mm -hmm. sort of military side to him. You know, he would roll his cigarettes up in his sleeve and I think mm -hmm. he fashioned himself very much that kind of person in the Navy. And you see pictures of him in the Navy and he's, um, you know, there's a very kind of romantic idea. I know he was a big fan of like Hope Crosby, World War II era kind of mm -hmm. films. Mm -hmm. That All that music is Mark's favorite music. Mm -hmm. So um, even though he served in the 80s, you know, I think that for him still tied into World War II in a time of men and, and men being men, as he said, and women being women, which is an interesting thing for him to say. Mm -hmm. And the Nazi, the World War II Nazi backdrop that you attribute to his family history? Yeah, it? he's German. His father was inscripted in World War II in the German Luftwaffe. Um, mm -hmm. and actually lost a leg in Belgium. And I, from what I can understand, um, Mark was always the grandchild who would ask Papa, about, as he called him, about the war and would hear these stories and get his head filled with these stories. So mm -hmm. that, um, I think, definitely played into Marlon Call's well. mm -hmm. And his mother is German? German, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that was very clear in the film. Yeah. His father is not no. present, but yeah. his mother was also the German. And yeah, mm -hmm. part of yeah, sure. All right. Um, now my meta question. Please, yeah. So I'm I mean, I, I think that this is a very um, tender film, and the kind of the mise en abîme or the parallelisms between what he's doing as a photographer and what you're doing as a director and mm -hmm. um, are you know unmistakable. And I was just wondering what that felt like for you, how you positioned yourself, or what kind of connections developed in terms of your affinities and alignments. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. No one's ever asked that, but it was really? a big part of Mark and I's relationship was mm -hmm. our love of trying to capture something, mm -hmm. you know, and particularly mm -hmm. capture an emotion. Mm -hmm. That's really what he tries to do. And I like to think that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, you're right. That was we still do that. I mean, we did that today on the phone. Let's talk about photography and what that is to try and capture something. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I guess at one point I told him, like, anything for the shot, you know, and that, that is, I don't know why I would say something so silly, but um, he, that he's held on to that for years as like, as you always say. <laughs> it's like, I guess I must have said that. Um, but yeah, he, um, that definitely bonded us, whatever you say, right away and still does to this day. And I mean, I just mm -hmm. saw him this summer and we just sat in Marwan Call and talked about like what our projects are next. I'm working on a film I, I want him to give me notes on. He's always asking, how's that film going? You know, so definitely mm -hmm. I think of him as a peer and he thinks of me as a peer in terms of, he always likes to call himself the world's greatest one six scale filmmaker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, and there which was, he might be. <laughs> there was even that slip when it, he said, 
whenever I'm stuck in my movie, yeah, and yeah. In my narrative, well, he slips on a pair of heels. Right, and, and right, yeah, and he says that to story. the couple, right? Yeah, right. at the art show. Right, yeah, but I he love called that. it his movie. I love that slip, yeah, because he, yeah. It's, um, it's telling. Yeah. yeah, okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Let's open it up. Um, I think we have uh, mics here ready to come to you. Just put your hand up if you have a question or a comment. And they will arrive. Um, I was just wondering about the, uh, his relearning of what he knew before the incident, the attack, mm -hmm. and how he described walking into his home and saying, do I have a girlfriend because there were all those shoes. And so did memories come back to him? And I'm wondering also about his knowledge of military history. Did that, was that something he had before that came back to him? A lot of it he... has, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I find that kind of strange. Um, a lot of it has come back through this process of taking pictures. He had diaries that you see a little bit of that kind of reminded him of things. Um, it seems to be this gradual and continuing to this day process of kind of relearning and re-remembering. And, you know, um, I think be one of the reasons Marvin Call was so powerful for him because it was not just creating, um, like child's play, well, maybe that's what his child's play is, is this creation of emotion. And somehow that seemed to stimulate thoughts or memories for him. Um, but you're right, I mean, it's spotty, and I think it's today still something that frustrates him, um, but it's something he continues to work on. What is going on in the town these days? <sighs> There's, um, it is, it's gotten really wild. Deja is like sort of the beginning of a world that has just, I mean, imagine a child who has played in this world for years, like the rules are gonna change and shift and constantly, he's sort of constantly wiping out the board and, and starting over again. Um, my wife has been following the story more than I have since the uh, movie came out and just published a book about it because we felt like the movie could only cover this much and Mark's world was, you know, this big. Um, so she kind of continues the story with Mark in book form um, because I always felt like the movie was a good kind of like supplement to an art book. So this is sort of like an art book encyclopedia. And um, in terms of uh, what's going on, it, it turned out this was all a dream <laughs> and it has now restarted and um, oh. Hoagie is a tank commander and there's a knight in Marwin Call that um, Deja can zap people into. <laughs> and it's, it's gotten completely meta. He didn't go too much further on that, the very end, that one six, one six thing where the one six dolls had one six dolls. Right. He, he played with that for a while, but it was, I think, ultimately too frustrating to, I mean, how are you gonna get emotion out of 136 scale models? So um, he didn't go too far on that, but to me that was sort of the perfect ending for our thing. I was wondering, because I, I noticed in, um, in some of the shots that um, you would see signage that would say Marwin Call, mm -hmm. and it looked like the COL had been written in later, and I'm wondering, was it always Marwin Call? Was it once Marwen? No. Did it evolve into Marwin Call? No, always Marwin Call. There's a, if anybody ever has the DVD, there's a deleted scene in there about his names of Marwin Call, and there's these fascinating lists of names that he was going to call it. Is Wind Kalmar and Hoagsville and you know, all these like 20 different names before he landed on Marwin Call. But no, he never, um, I don't know why that would be. Um, was it uh, painted or was it uh, sticky letters painted? Hmm, I don't know why. But no, it's always Marwin Call. Obviously, Marwin Call being Mark, Wendy, Colleen. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about the still photographs um, and whether or not most of the photographs used were Mark's or if they were your own? Entirely yes. his. Okay. Yeah, all his. And all of the reenactment? Uh, entirely his, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that, so, and I see why people don't know that, and I, I kind of liked that sort of falling into that because he never saw them as art or as, do you know what I mean? So it's like, I think by the time you get to the art show, you realize, oh, these were all photographs that I've been seeing, which is sort of parallel to his experience of what those photographs for him were because they were memories, they were thoughts, they weren't art, they weren't, you know what I mean? So um, it, 
I know what you mean, and I didn't do it on purpose, but when it landed there, I, I sort of didn't mind that, that it was that way. We uh, see from the journals that pre-attack, he was quite an artist. Yeah. But what was he pre-attack in terms of photography and in terms of dolls? And right. I mean, did he know the model shop guy pre-attack? Yeah, he did. Did he build models? He would, you know, he was a desperate alcoholic, so he could never quite get it together. You know, um, he seemed to have talent that was heading in all different directions, but could never be synthesized into something concrete, you know? And he knows that this attack in some horrible, weird way f focused his, his creativity in a way that he wasn't able to do because of the alcoholism. But uh, he worked at a lighting shop on and off. You know, he was arrested a lot. He, um, he was, I always took him for like that guy in the back of class who just couldn't help but scribble and, and draw. And, you know, a lot of the people on his Navy boat have gotten hold of me and would s scan and send pictures of, that they still have that Mark drew of them. You know, he was that guy who would like try and, try and press the girl with like, oh, here's a picture of you. You know, but it never got beyond that. Like it, it, his diaries would talk about the idea of a kid's book or it would talk, but it could never, he never got past that, you know, it's, it never got to that point where he was doing what he really wanted to do. Yes. I'm wondering about the consequences of the process for him in terms of the film being therapy now. So, and then obviously the book. Uh -huh. So obviously there's a consequence to him, you know, doing his own photography as therapy, uh -huh. and then how your making of the film plays into his therapy. Sure. And then, as you've said, your wife writing a book, yeah. how that plays in. And then just in terms of the sheer, um, both economics and cultural economics in terms of where are the benefits? So how does he benefit in right. other ways from you making the film? Right, right. And then how, from the, the book that you, and you've said your wife has written. So, you know, that kind of playing out sure. of the power relations. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, that's definitely an interesting aspect of documentary filmmaking is that power dynamic of subject and filmmaker. So luckily, he was my friend. And luckily, I didn't expect this to be anything. I mean, this was just something I did with my friend just sort of to explain to him. Do you know what I mean? Like how I saw him, almost just like a portrait or something. I thought it was going to be 10 minutes long, you know, and over four years of working on it, it became this film and then people actually saw it and then it, you know, so as that, um, as the film kind of took shape into something real, at each step you have to kind of check, is this okay with you? You know, and it was very much that scene where he's going to New York and oh, you know, my built my own call for me. He's still at that point of struggling with that and we always have to make sure that he's okay with that. You know, of he and my wife are going to New York uh, next week, and he's looking forward to it. But you know, there's still that small fear of like, you know, why do I have to be interviewed by Wired? You know, and it's but he also loves it. So it's like, you know, and it's also been an opportunity for him to, you know, it, in my mind, with the subject, you it's it's not enough to just film them. Like, God willing, they don't really want that. I mean, part of him likes it, but like. There has to be something more. So his opportunity to kind of re-identify as an artist, because keep in mind when we started shooting, people would just yell at him on the side of the road, you know, swear words and bad, you know. And then also I put into our agreement that he will always make more money on the film than I will. So he's had a chance, to, he has a, a trust fund and he's had a chance to make, you know, he's done well with it. Um, and then likewise, hopefully, if the book does well, he will, you know, same situation with that. So, um, you know, hopefully it's a case where he's taken care of, you know, and, it, and it's luckily he is my friend because it becomes, you realize later, if it, you do it right, a lifelong commitment to making sure they're okay. You know what I mean? And his mother, who has since died, made me promise on her deathbed that I would take care of him and I would have anyway, but that's heavy stuff. You know what I mean? So. Um, so I think it's all been positive and I think, you know, Mark attracts 
good people. And that's why I put in there, you know, he's looking for a gallerist. It was like this like radio signal and he found that gallerist, you know, who lives near him and takes good care of him. And, um, you know, um, so yeah, it's, I, everyone is different on that. Uh, to me, that's super important. And I, I hold my head up high that when I think about it, which I don't, but the, when I'm, when asked that, that it's because that's essential, you know, and it, and it is a strange dynamic because you're, we're all trying to li look inside this private world, right? Mm -hmm. And he's been kind enough to show us. So there's responsibility there as an audience member, as a filmmaker, you know, to honor that experience and to, you know, it's, it's a strange line, you know, but it's something that we're always aware of. And I think if you're doing that and you're doing it for the right reasons, and luckily most documentary filmmakers are doing it for the right reasons, then you're fine. Can I just ask a question yeah. um, on the basis of what you just said? Could you talk about um, both how you understand what his publics now are in search of or are drawn to, and then along with that, maybe what you, what the feeling was that drew you to his world and his um, in, engagement sort of right. with him, him, his selves. I think I was at a point in my life where I was wondering how to kind of rebuild a life. And here was someone who had done it so beautifully and so just holistically and artistically and all those wonderful things that I just, you know, I was a subscriber to a Sopus magazine that you see in there. Mm -hmm. And I saw those pictures That's and awesome. that article. And it, Todd, who you see in the film, did such a wonderful job, I think, of, and I hope that I mimic this in the movie, of kind of an asking a lot of questions, raising a lot of questions, but not necessarily answering them and allowing you to kind of answer them for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I, in reading this article, had a bunch of questions and, and just sort of said, okay, I want to go figure this out. You know, mm -hmm. s sillily thinking that, stupidly thinking that I could do it in a weekend and it would be 10 minutes long and it'd be this beautiful, sad little piano piece about this guy who got beat up in You know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, then you realize you have a lot bigger job than that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so to me, it was that. It's like, you know, just somebody who had found a way to rebuild a life that was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And I think that that's what an audience is drawn to. And luckily, mm -hmm. and to kind of play off one of the things you're saying, is that to me that's essential is that Mark has never lost that relationship with Marwan Call. That he's still doing, and we talk about this, and I assume he would do it even if we didn't talk about it, but it's like to not lose that personal connection to what he's doing. He's not doing it for other people that's a side effect of him doing it for himself. Mm -hmm. And that's a benefit of, you know, but it's not the reason he's doing it. And if he ever lost that, then he wouldn't, it wouldn't really exist the way it exists here, you know. So. Uh, I'm wondering if you have ever talked to him about his dreams at night? Mm. I think I did, and he said that he doesn't remember them and he's really frustrated that he doesn't remember them. Um, he's a big, he's a big believer in the idea of dreams and, you know, I mean, he still keeps the Deja doll here and talks to her and he's wants to live outside of his kind of realistic realm, but I think as I remember it, his dreams frustrated him that he doesn't ever remember them. That's what I'm remembering. Uh, I know that in the film he kind of just took, it, it made it look like the, the photographs that he was taking were scattered. Um, was there like a narrative structure to the way he was taking the photographs and to the way they were displayed at the gallery? Um, scattered in terms of they were like for the purpose of in the film. In terms of like this to keep in the storyline as, uh -huh. as he imagined it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that is, you know, important to remember is that all those stills that you see that I have sometimes put out of order 
many times out of order to explain certain things, are part of a story. With the exception of that one where uh, the guy has the other guy on his back, that really amazing one, um, it's Rescuing the Major, it's called. Uh, the exception of that that he did for a photo contest, every one of them in there and in the book is part of a story. So they're all actually part of a narrative. I'm just taking them out of context, and then the art shows particularly take them out of context. Do you know what I mean? Because they'll organize them by the women of Marlon Call or something like that. So he did photograph every single, oh, yeah. every single part of the story. Inside a story, yeah. And I'm plucking them for, you know. He, one thing I, he would do when I would first show up, I noticed, was he would, I always think that's interesting in documentaries, what does the subject say when you first show up? It's like when you haven't seen a friend for a while, and it's like, oh, this thing i got to tell you. And it's like, you never have the camera ready. And so it's like, <laughs> I've learned with him especially, it's like, get that camera rolling in the car and like <laughs> knock on the door because he's going to tell you something fascinating right off. And one thing he would always do would be like, hey, let me show you what's going on in Marlin Call. And he would click through on his computer the images. So, and those became the narration of those scenes, you know, when he would kind of go through the scenes of him being caught in the church and things like that. And as much as I could, I would try and use his cut points, so to speak, mm -hmm. as he told the story as my edit points. You know, and I would just kind of like lazily, kind of awkwardly shoot the screen just so I would know what stills he was talking about, and then I would place them in later. Um, and so, yeah, he, that's kind of how he thinks about it, is just like what's, I mean, you would, you will call him, and he would, his first thing would be like, oh, I'm so upset. Uh, you know, Deja did this thing, and you know what I mean? So it's like, that's how he's constantly thinking of it. You know, he just can like go there. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. I saw this <clears throat> marvelous film. Uh, I was thinking about another uh, outsider artist, uh, like Henry Darger. Sure. Uh, with his armies of girls. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I, and just this obsessive universe that right. he completely lived in. Of course, nobody ever got to see uh, it until he was gone. Right. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering if that comparison ever comes up. Um, it does, because it's, I think, natural in the realms of the unreal is that film. And I think it's a, to me personally, I think it's a fascinating film. The thing that um, I wanted to make sure I did in this film was have Mark speak for himself. To me, it's mm -hmm. very frustrating. And I think they smartly wrapped that around into the center of that film, that he couldn't speak for himself. But I think especially in the world of outsider art, there's often, in my mind, this kind of unspoken or spoken or half-spoken creepiness factor that is like part of the equation. And I think that as I met Mark, I wanted to kind of bust some of the rules of outsider art a little bit, um, at least for me, in terms of getting to know somebody. Um, because I think that whole term can be, although I find it fascinating and I love that art, the term can be dangerous, and it's like, um, you know, it's as with anything, it's it's loaded with with meanings that sometimes are damaging. So, um, so yeah, that that film definitely comes up a lot, and I find Henry Darger fascinating. I just wish I could have heard from Henry Darger and not, yes. you know, sometimes I just feel like that guy got a bad deal. So I, I'm glad that I was able to honor Mark's experience and that people like Mark. You know, because Mark is a wonderful person, and like that to me is the goal of documentary: is to get to know people you wouldn't normally get to know. So. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning, we see that Mark is overdraft um, account when he gets his oh, uh, yeah, back yeah. statement, um, but he's able to create Mark on what is like a limited budget. <laughs> right. How, well, well, yeah, well, you have the answer, don't you? <laughs> yeah, but now that he has a trust fund and, uh, and more money, is Marocall going to grow? Or it did for a get, while. It did. It like, if you look on the, if you look on the, even between the time we finished the film and released the DVD, he got enough money where, like, the, you know how when you put in a DVD, there's, like, uh, come floating images? I shot a bunch of images of sort of new Marwin Call. And there's planes, and there's like he he went wild for a while, and um, I mean he just had bombers and like 
just everything. I mean, it was like, and because it had expanded into this like magical world, he could do anything. So it was like speedboats and, you know, like he just went radio controlled crazy and, you know, but it, he's now, he's now pulled it back. And I think, um, as he said, he's like, Hey, I never had a chance to like blow money. And, you know, it's an amusement park in the works here <laughs> yeah, in Florida, totally. the Morrow and Call. Yeah, yeah, totally. But now he's actually, I mean, somebody said, what's up with Morrow and Call? I mean, he's now thinking about um, working with one, one scale dolls and mannequins. So he's, mm -hmm. he's kind of said today, actually, he said that he's just done everything he can do in one six and he's kind of bored mm -hmm. and he needs to like move on. So he's now, and he wants to be a real film director. It's like how everybody oh. says, calls me a documentary filmmaker. I'm like, but I thought I was a filmmaker. You know, like he feels that way about one six scale. He's like, but I'm a filmmaker too. So I think he wants to prove that he can, you know, really do it one, one scale. <laughs> I, in the I was, I was uh, oh. curious if you could share a little bit about how this film transformed you in particular uh. and your filmmaking, particularly how you made a world as a documentary about a right. who right. made a world and shooting forward on the other end uh, as far as future projects and other worlds that you wish to make with right. people that are also making worlds. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I got really lucky meeting him. It kind of, you know, I had gone to film school a long time ago and I'd worked as an editor and I'd loved documentary and I always loved the potential of documentary. And um, I loved editing it so much that I, want, I said, okay, you know, I'm gonna try and shoot something so that I can be fully in charge of it, but I'll just do a little tiny thing. I don't know what it is. And that same week I saw that article on Mark and I thought, okay, this is it, you know, this is what I'll do. And um, so over the course of those four years, it really was able, it was something that really allowed me to grow, but it also allowed me to kind of synthesize all these things that I had felt about what documentary can be in terms of empathy and uh, things like that. So I think it really was, you know, the thing that allowed me to realize what I wanted to do, that I wanted to do portraits of people that I loved, that I cared about. You know, I mean, you work so long on a film, it's, I, I can't imagine all my friends who are doing films about people they don't like, you know, for f four or five years, I just, I don't know if I could, I could do that, you know? Um, and it made me realize, I mean, there's still stuff I can't decide about him. So it made me realize that it's nice to find a subject that's bigger than your frame that you don't have the answers to. That was a big one, you know, of like, I think documentary is this constant reminder of not knowing and giving up, giving up the knowing aspect. Um, and then also on the creating worlds level, I think it made me realize how much I loved films about art and the power, the true power of art, because I think it gets neglected and unfunded. So, you know, this, we spent the last four years after this, my wife and I doing a film about a um, town in Italy that has been dealing with all their issues on stage for the last 50 years. They put on a play every year where they play themselves on stage. So, um, you know, another kind of example of people that I love that are using art in interesting ways that I can't quite fully get my ha hands around, but I'm try and I want to offer that experience back up for other people to watch it in a way that they can have their own opinions too, you know? So yeah, I got really lucky in that way. It was totally, you know, um, and, and it was fun with, to work with Mark and to kind of go down that road together, you know, like it was such a victory when he got to the art show. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, if that, that, Manchu's line, which is such a wonderful line, I think, ultimately, because it's so much about, like, everybody's been there, like, what you can't pull off, you know what I mean? Like, you wish you could pull it off, but you can't pull it off. That was just us having a cigarette, and, you know, I would have never thought that'd be the movie. The, mo the movie was just getting there, you know, and trying to get your friend there. So, I, and again, that's the great thing about documentary is that the one thing you can count on is the experience that you have with your subjects. So if you get to go somewhere with them, then you can't beat it. You know, everything else is icing on the cake, so. You, most, you literally encode that into the film in so many shots where 
uh, Mark is literally bigger than the frame. Right. And his, you know, you see, you don't see the top of his head. And, yeah. and I, I had the feeling that I was one of the dolls looking Ooh, up at him. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's yeah, good. Yeah, so that he's sort of, it, that's part of the Ooh, I like that. of it, I, I think. I'd yeah. like to think that was, that was intentional <laughs> on some level. It probably we don't was. don't care about I mean, intention. Yeah, 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 it was intentional. You meant it, exactly. And well, maybe somewhere right, right. it did. I like that. That's good. All right. I wanted to say thank you so much for this film. It was fantastic. Oh, thanks. Um, and I wanted to find out, were you happy with the doll that Mark chose to represent you? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. He um, started off, I don't think this is in the film, he started off as a German. He was a German <laughs> uh, war photographer. Uh -huh. And I... You know, I've le long learned that you don't ask Mark questions about your doll. Like, you will meet a bitter end if you ask too many questions. Um, like, something bad will happen to your doll. Um, so I didn't, you know, <laughs> I didn't push it. But I, I, had, I had questions about why I was German. <laughs> and, um, and so one day he sent me some photos and he said, your doll, he changed sides. He works for the Associated Press now. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> So he became, um, he's actually, <coughs> there's some really great photos um, that were later than the film that are in the book of him. Um, it, this is a good one. It was he um, eventually, after the film, no, before the film was finished, he said um, he gave me a F Malmberg Film Studios for my doll above Town Hall. Uh -huh. And I was like, wow, that's, why'd you do that? And he said, Oh, so you can finish the movie. <laughs> because, <laughs> like, you look at his diaries from that time, and he's like, he's never going to finish my movie. You know, he just got married. Can you believe it? Um, so, you know, he, um, that was the doll, that was the job of Malmberg Film Studios above the town hall, was to make sure I had a place where I could concentrate and finish the film. Um, so, yeah. That's such a beautiful merging of borders between sort of the real and the virtual, because... That also comes out when the people in his neighborhood are interviewed about the destinies of their doll. And yeah. They're very upset. What do you mean you killed me off? <laughs> what, what did I do? I mean, so, yeah. so that they're brought into this right. world that's bigger than. Right. I had forgotten that moment. That was with Ruthie, right. who's one of the waitresses. Right. And that she was, was us just sitting around before I was going to interview her. And then I realized just her being upset like that, I had n absolutely no need for the interview because she was just going to say, oh, I was upset. But to see her be upset, you know, that's, that's when, you know, verite, as you call it, beats interview every time, right? Right, right. Um, it was, yeah. yeah. Well, as if you didn't have enough drama and fascinating things in the movie, the cross-dressing was... Yeah. And it, it, you handled it so dramatically because, of course, nobody had a clue. But I'm so, I'm, I'm so fascinated that he didn't... that that wasn't something he lost his memory yeah. about. And I mean, if you want to talk about that a little bit and... Yeah, I mean, that was... Um... <laughs> You know, that's just how he showed me when he opens up those things. And, you know, I was shooting the bar at the time, and he said, hey, as long as you got that thing on, I pan over, and that's where the shot starts. And he, you know, oh, I've got these women's shoes, and I remember, th talk about, like, allowing yourself to be, like, you know, stop doing the movie you think you're doing and, like, start seeing the movie that's in front of you. Um, I just couldn't figure out what in the world was going on, you know? Um, well, he said it just keeps getting weirder. <laughs> That's right? such a great line, too. Yeah, totally. And um, so, yeah. Uh, and it was always a battle to figure out where to place that. And ultimately, you know, you shoot for four years, you have like hundreds of hours of really fascinating stuff. But it all came down to, does it relate to Marwan Call? How far from the center of Marwan Call is it? And you can't actually get very far. So everything has to like reflect off of that. So the shoes, which was essential that as soon as we realized that he was beat up because of the cross-dressing, which was something, and there's an example of the great thing about documentary and what you can get with your subjects, or what your subjects can get out of it, was he didn't know until he heard, he saw the rough cut of that audio that my wife dug out through um, the courts that he was for sure beat up because he said he thought maybe he'd done something wrong or he'd been offensive in some way 
So, you know, that was a big thing for him to realize. And his mom was always on his case. Oh, you must have done something. You must have done something. And so the next day after he saw the rough cut, he's like, no, mom, I heard it. I didn't do anything. I just said I was a cross dresser and they beat me up. And that was a big thing for him to get past that he hadn't done anything wrong to deserve it. And um, so that to me was like a big moment of working with him and things that you can provide to him because we were kind of traveling down that road together, unraveling that we would go and I mean, we had whole scenes interviewing the woman who found him, who thought he was a garbage bag on the side of the road, this beautiful woman named Nora, who was just so sweet and basically saved his life, but turning him over, you know, and all this blood came out of him. And, but you know, anyway, so you have this like kind of amazing thing that, oh wait, he was, beat up, he lost all his memory, he started over, but he was beat up for being a cross-dresser. But until he goes to the art show and can't decide what to wear, that's why a line like Manchu seems a throwaway, but it's actually everything. Because it's like, oh, this is about how do you want to re-identify in your second life? Like you've worked hard to have a second life, so to speak. Now you get to choose your identity. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, once I found that connection, then the perfect place for the shoes was kind of once you get to know Mark and once you love Mark, it's kind of that, I always feel like with documentary films like, or anything, like if you go to dinner with somebody, like, you know, a couple drinks into a fabulous dinner, they can tell you almost anything and you accept it and you like them because that's, that's <laughs> you're in, you know, you've, you've laughed together, you've, you've, you know, made a connection. So I wanted to make sure that this person that, that we all accept him when he says those things. If you were to say that thing right off, well, he's a male heterosexual cross-dresser who blah, blah, blah. Every movie does that, and it's like, I feel like they become lab rats. They're not human, you know what I mean? So like, I wanted to make sure this was someone who was human first, and then afterwards, who cares? Oh yeah, I guess he is, you know? And then at a certain point, I had to pull out the term male heter heterosexual, I think he says it twice. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, that was the whole thing to kind of figure out with him. Um, I think Tom, his roommate, said that, or maybe Mark said, as soon as he put his foot in the shoe, then he felt like, oh, this feels right. You know, so that was like his sort of first sense memory, he said. So, anyway. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly what I want to ask, but just in terms of gender roles and stuff, that was a thing to me was taking on what people said before. I th thought it was an interesting moment to, dis to, to, yeah, to get to the moment where he you know, shows uh, or talks about the shoes and, and I was fascinated by how he's like obsessed maybe with like the traditional gender roles and like yeah. throughout the movie and the, and the sexist kind of like almost uh, comments and, and yeah. I was wondering how actually he is actually now and if he ever, like how his awareness about these kind of things is like being a cross-dresser in his past life, being a cross-dresser maybe now in his new life, and if he ever also considers like talking about it publicly and uh -huh. as, as like a hate crime. Right. Um, good, good points. Yeah, I've always been fascinated too by, mm -hmm. and that's why some of those scenes are in there of like right. that scene I call Gay Town where he's like, you know, I don't want to, what is this? I forget the reference, but there's some weird, like, kind of strange thing he says about, like, well, why is it all Barbies all or something? Or why is it all men? men. All I don't men. want to be. Yeah, gay town. Yeah, and every time I see that se scene, I'm yeah. like, man, I can't believe I put that in, but I'm so glad I did because it points out that he's not perfect and that his version of identity and gender and all these things is really goofy and just like anybody's is it's not you know what I mean it's like he's he's a real person and you know he he has he's he's difficult you know what I mean so yeah I find that absolutely fascinating and um I I think he's very comfortable in it and he would always say to me you know when we we're filming oh this is for duty and humanity you know like he knew that he had a special story, and he knew that the cross-dressing played into it. Um, as soon as he showed me the shoe closet, I started shooting it, that kind of stuff. Then I started noticing, like, oh, wait, he's wearing, like, in that, the clogs. yeah, he's wearing, like, clogs or the, um, the okay. pantyhose and stuff. Um, so I started making those connections and started shooting that. 
And he'd be like, well, why are you shooting that? And I'd be like, well, I think it's part of the story. And he's like, yeah, I guess so. So it's like, it was definitely a, you know, kind of a progressive thing. But I think he's become more um, tolerant. Um, I think he's, he's sort of, his story has taught himself to be more tolerant in a weird way. Like we were just talking about Caitlyn, what's the name? Jenner, Jenner. 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 is that right? Jenner. No, is that the name, Caitlyn Jenner? Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. And, um, we were just talking about that, and that was really interesting. There was, I don't know if anybody saw this, but there was this weird thing that happened a couple months ago where somebody used one of his photos as an example. They mistook it for a real war photo, and they used it as an example of like, I'm sick of these people talking about Caitlyn Jenner being a hero. Uh, I mean, look at this, this is real heroism. <laughs> and then it took a while for people to point out to this guy, and this guy got like a million likes you know, on his thing. And then it took a while for people to point out, you know, this image that you pulled is actually the image by a male heterosexual crossdresser who got beat up for, you know, so the irony sort of like poured on thick at that point. But um, so he, he was, and I talked to him about that when that was happening. And he was like really proud that he could be part of that, you know? So I think he's like, yeah, and we've played some, uh, you know, like transgender festivals and stuff and he's cool with that. So I think he's, he's opening up to those things. But it's strange how sometimes, cause I feel like he's kind of a role model in that way of just showing us, you know what I mean? But it's weird how sometimes those role models aren't like, fully up for the job sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. We have, uh, we have time for one more. Obviously, he had a trauma. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering uh, if he's seeing any psychologists and have you taken shots uh, that you can't show? Taking shots. Reason, I mean, have you, you shot show. that part of a discussion between oh. him and psychologists? Yeah. We've and the reason I ask this mm -hmm. question, uh, because of the number of soldiers that are suffering from PTSD. Yeah. And I wonder whether in your work uh, you have seen any similarity in some aspect with some of them. Uh huh. Yeah, he, I mean, that was one of his big frustrations was that his therapy was taken away. He's a big believer in therapy. He learned a bunch about therapy when he was an alcoholic through AA and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, he's a lot of the way the things he says is very much things that you learn in AA. He's still kind of, those are his railroad tracks still. So when his therapy, which was across the board, was taken away um, because he couldn't afford the cab ride to Poughkeepsie or wherever it was to go there. Um, that angered him to such a degree that that kind of propelled him into Marwan Call of like, you know, I'm gonna create my own therapy. So, you know, but it's interesting that he doesn't, he's not, in, we've talked to him about like, you know, you have money to go to therapy now. And he toys with it, but he's never actually done it. Okay, well, thank you so much thank you for guys. being with us and answering. Thanks. Will you come back when you finish your next film? Yeah, let's okay, do it. Okay, great. Well, we'll yeah. see you. Okay.